social media apps. Uh, I've been sort of getting into some of these with my kids. I'm sort of, I consider myself more like a social media introvert, like I'd just rather not. And uh, nevertheless, my kids are into it, so I've been getting into them just a little bit, sort of having some fun with them. Some of you parents know what I'm talking about. So one of these uh, apps that I was, uh, had installed and starting to use a little bit this past week has AR, art, artificial intelligence. And this person that you can, you know, artificial intelligent person that you can text and have a conversation with. I don't know if you've ever tried this. It's kind of crazy what's going on with artificial intelligence. And so I just decided I'm going to ask the artificial intelligence, who is Jesus Christ? So I did. And it spits a response back to you, and I'll just, re- I'll just, re- I'll just read what my artificial intelligence said. It said, Jesus Christ is the Son of God who was sent to earth to save us from our sins. He lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and rose again on the third day. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and those who believe in him will have eternal life. Is that good? Amen. Amen. Is that a good response by artificial intelligence? And my hope and my prayer today is that we will never, ever, ever have to depend on artificial intelligence to tell the story of God because Jesus has told us to tell it all the time, amen? And so our hope today is that we all would embrace the call on our lives to go share this message, maybe get this good at sharing it in that quick, but we're gonna just talk a little bit about that today. Um, I would love for you to stand for the reading of the word of God today. This is such powerful word. I know it's been up and down today, but let's get a little blood flowing here today, right? And uh, I'm going to read to you what the Apostle Paul says to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 10 through 21. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. For the love of Christ compels us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh We regard him thus no longer. In other words, Jesus rose from the dead, and he is so much more than flesh. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. It's crazy that God is making his appeal through us, but you're who God has chosen We implore you, this is not we invite you, this is, the the word implored literally means beg. We implore you, beg you on on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let's pray. Lord, would you have your way in our hearts today? And in our minds today, Lord God, would you rekindle the passion in our lives to share the message of reconciliation, to appeal to people on your behalf, the hope that we have, the new life that we have in Christ. I pray that, God, your spirit would move powerfully in this place today, that you would give us confidence, and God, that you would give us heart and passion pray that the scriptures, the spirit would come in power today. And we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, 
Amen. You may be seated. So we are in a series called The Words That We Speak, and we've been talking over the last couple of weeks about our words, how powerful your words are. Uh, we have talked about uh, the power of our words. Our words are powerful to direct the course of life. You, with your words, can literally shape the direction of your life and the life of people around you. They have the power to destroy. You can literally destroy a person with your words. And they have the power to delight, to be pleasing to people. And the scripture verse for the series is Psalms 18, excuse me, Proverbs 18, 20 through 21. A man's stomach shall be filled, uh, shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth and from the produce of his lips he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And the words that you speak is what your soul is eating. And so if you're negative, if you're critical, if you're complaining, if life is just the worst thing in the world for you, guess, that's coming out of your mouth, guess what's going on in your heart? You're speaking right into your heart and you're eating the very words. And your words are a reflection of what's in your heart. And so it would be good that if you're in that place living in the dumps that you would start to speak a new language. And that's the hope of this series and the hope of the gospel is that we can speak a new language in Christ and we have hope and we have pro promises and possibility in Christ and we ought to be a people, last week we talked about the language of heaven, that we ought to be going about the world speaking the language of heaven here on earth and thereby bringing heaven onto earth and talked about a couple phrases last week that we would speak that are powerful, that the world desperately needs. Today, I want to talk about, teach on the most powerful words we can speak. These words are the words of the gospel. Uh, if you have been in church for a while, these are not new words to you probably. They're not wor new words to your mind but they may be words that haven't been coming out of your mouth a whole lot lately. And we desperately need, God has appointed us to appeal to others on his behalf and to share the message of the gospel, the message of reconciliation that God, reconciliation means peace between two people, that God would be reconciled, that mankind would be reconciled to God, and we're called to speak these words, and these words are the most powerful words that you can speak. Uh, the Apostle Paul speaks about this in Romans 1.16. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Uh, when you speak the words of the message of reconciliation to people, uh, there is power, an inherent power in the words that the Spirit is using in your life. In Acts chapter 1-8, Jesus, one of the final things that he said, actually the last thing that he said, is that his disciples, his followers, would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them and that they would be his witnesses. And there is no plan B for witnessing. It's not artificial intelligence. It is us that we would share uh, the message of the gospel with people, that we would incarnate the truth and the message. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul talks about his concerns with himself. And maybe for you, you're sort of like, I don't speak well. Or I don't, uh, I'm sort of fearful of having this conversation. Here's what the Apostle Paul said. He said, I, I was with you. He's talking about the Corinthian believers. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, in my speech and my message, we were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Apostle Paul is just saying, look, if you would take a shot, take a chance, like share the message of salvation and reconciliation with people, if you would do this, there is a power in, those, in that message, in that word. 
and it brings people to life, and it shapes the very direction of their life. And, and so I just believe that like, we need to be speaking this message. And let me ask you the question, if you are in Christ, by the way, if you're not in Christ, you're not a believer, you're new to church, well, you're, you're gonna hear me talk today more to believers, but there is more to those that have trusted Christ, but there is a message in this for you because this is the most important message, the most important thing that you could understand in your life. But we need to speak this often. And let me ask you the question, when's the last time you spoke? The message of reconciliation, of salvation to people. When's the last time you told someone, this is how you can have a relationship with God, know God, and be at peace with God? When's the last time you asked someone if you were to die today, do you know that you would spend eternity with God? This is the most powerful message that we can speak, and we ought to speak it often. I'm, I, even in prepping to teach this, I, I, I've been, my, my mind this past week has been like, God, where shall I speak this message? And there's a few observations that I have is walking through this past week and looking at culture today uh, related to this. The first is that our culture is confused. Your neighbors are confused about how a person comes to Christ, about how a person is, finds peace with God. Uh, the majority of our culture uh, that I interact with it, it believes that people must do a whole lot of good works in order to be at peace with God. I was at the Gulf gas station, which is just down the road from Mill Pond, where our office is this past week, just a, actually a few days ago, and I walked in, and there was a dad there that I know, I coached his son in football uh, two years ago, and I, I just said, hey, what's going on, and how's your son doing, and started talking about his son, and both of his sons, and before long, we found ourselves in about a 25-minute conversation in the gas station, and uh, he was telling me about, you know, the busyness of life and sports and all the different things we were talking about, but he said, you know, my younger son is very interested in faith. The father went on to tell me that he himself was uh, agnostic, that he had grown up in a faith tradition, and that... Uh, there were some leaders in that faith tradition that really disappointed him, and, and he just left it and, and became agnostic. But he said, you know, I want my son to understand and my son to make a choice, and so we're getting up at 6.30 on Sunday mornings, and we're driving to New Britain to, uh, so he can learn about faith. So as we continued to talk, it became very clear that his understanding of this faith was that if they were to do enough good things, that they would be accepted, that they would find peace with God. And as I was listening, I was like, well, I think you know I'm a pastor, right? He's like, yeah, I've, I've seen the signs. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I said, you know, the message of Jesus and the message of the Bible is that you could never do enough. It's not do, it's Jesus has done the work. And he is inviting you. He has solved the chasm that exists between us and God, the broken relationship between us and God. Jesus has done it. And we talked a little further and, and went our ways. A couple of years ago, I, I, uh, I was doing discipleship with a group of guys. These were young adults, and we were studying world religions. And, and I said, you know, let's study Islam a little bit, and, and, and let's make this practical. And so uh, I, I knew uh, one of the pastors at our church knew uh, the, the imam at the, the mosque down in Farmington. And so I said, hey, do you think I could give him a call and we could just go visit and we could kind of watch and see what happens and then meet with him afterwards? And so he said, sure. So I called him up and he said, yeah, come on down. We went down to a service and we sat in the very back. I don't know if they call it a service, but uh, they're gathering. And I sat in the very back uh, with, with a couple guys and we just watched and the men came in and the women came in and the men were kneeling down in a very reverent way, and they were praying 
these prayers. And uh, the women were on the other side, and they were kneeling down, and they were pray- praying these prayers, and we just watched. And, and afterwards, we met with the imam, and we, and we said, so, so how does a person find peace with God? How does a person find salvation? And he said, well, uh, you know, your life, God is looking at the good that you do and the bad that you do. And uh, when you die, you will appear before God, and, and he will weigh the good and the bad. And if you do more good than bad, uh, then you will be, enter into paradise. Now, if you do more bad than good, then you will not. And I said, well, is it possible to know that before you get to that place? He said, no, no one knows. No one will ultimately know until that day. Uh, we are living in a culture that is confused about the good news of Jesus Christ, and they believe that we must do enough so that we can be accepted. And I could tell you several other stories this past week. I won't take the time. But we are living in this confused culture. Second, we have children that are less churched than they have been in the majority of American history. Uh, we, have, we have kids that are growing up in our culture that did not grow up going to church. If you go back 50 years ago, it was much more of a Christian nation. And so uh, many people, many children today are growing up and they don't understand anything about the gospel. And therefore, it is critical that we not just share the good news and the stories of God here, but that we go and we share the good news of the, of the gospel uh, Studies years ago tell us that a person, this was years ago, needs seven different conversations and relationships with Christians before they come to, before they turn to Christ, repent and believe. And if that's true, it's important not just that we do it here or that I do it, but that we all join the call of God to make his appeal to people. Another observation that I have is that we have lost, I believe, the sense of personal responsibility and maybe even skill for sharing the message of salvation. Uh, We have, in a sense, tried to live lifestyle evangelism without speaking the message of evangelism. And it is God's desire that we not live in su- just live in such a way, but that we speak the message. In fact, there's a, a quote that is attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, uh, of which his followers, many of his followers said he didn't actually say, but nevertheless, it's spoken quite a bit. I'll show you the quote right here, and it, 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 those that would say that he attributed this to him say, preach the gospel always, and if necessary, use words. Well, I want to just show you a quick video of one of the speakers that uh, refers to this video and explains it. Watch this. Hey, listen, I was speaking at a, at a church here in, um, in the United States, and uh, uh, there was a church that has become kind of very much engaged with the whole missional conversation, and uh, they're trying to kind of uh, uh, move their, their community into a, a commitment to a deeper missional engagement in their neighborhood and so on and so forth. And I happened to be in their town and they invited me to speak on their Sunday morning service. And after it was over, the first guy to come and talk to me was an older man and he said to me, um, he said, look, I've got some problems about this whole missional kind of gig, quite frankly. It's like, I've been, I've been a bit anxious about what's happening. Ever since our church started talking about being missional, uh, we don't do evangelism anymore. And I said, well, then your church hasn't got any clue what it means to be missional. It just seems to me as though there's become some kind of trend in, in various churches to, to reduce being missional to simply uh, acts of kindness and service and relationship building in their neighborhood. But my friends, if we don't ever get an opportunity to announce the name of Jesus and declare that he is king and rules over all and demands allegiance of every man, woman, and child, then we are not being missional. Have you heard those folks that like to quote St. Francis of Assisi, uh, preach the gospel always and if necessary use words? 
The only people that ever quote that to me are people who don't ever use any words. It's kind of like this is our, our way out. It's like my whole life is just preaching the gospel, but I don't actually ever declare anything or say anything. Folks, that's not missional. Are you with me? Uh, in fact, uh, David Bosch, the great um, uh, South African missiologist, in response to that quote from St. Francis, said this, of course words are necessary. Unexplained deeds in themselves do not constitute the mission of God's people. Unexplained deeds in themselves do not constitute the mission of God's people. Now, I think it is magnificent that the church, which was once so removed and detached and so devoted to an attractional model, come to us to get the kind of the religious goods and services, has come to a point where there is a rediscovery of incarnational living, of acts of service and kindness, of a recognition of justice as a demonstration of the reign of God, as a commitment to peacemaking and placemaking and friendship building absolutely delighted by it. In fact, I did my best to try to initiate that conversation in our churches. But if that comes at the expense of us actually articulating or speaking about the Lordship of Jesus, then it does not in itself constitute the mission of God's people. It's God's plan that we would make his appeal to people that they would be reconciled to God. I thought it interesting, I was reading this past week, pulled out the evangelism books and was reading actually a textbook, a college textbook on evangelism, which I actually was loving. And the professor was telling about one of the individuals that he knew, one of the guys knew, that he knew that uh, uh, was a Christian businessman. I think he had worked in you know, a, an organization, a corporation with a lot of people. And really for years just lived like Christ, served people and, and loved people and really sought to just live this life and, and represent Christ well, but never spoke uh, about his faith, never shared the message of reconciliation with this other man that he worked with. The, the other man went to a Billy Graham crusade one night and he trusted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He came back to the work the next day and, and he said to the man, he said, hey, listen, I, uh, I went to this, this conference last night and Billy Graham spoke and I came to Christ. And um, man, I, I'm new. I, I have this new life today. And the man that was, was elated and he said, that is amazing. I've been praying for you for years. And the response of the man that came to Christ, he, he said, you know, I never pursued faith because I looked at your life and thought you lived such a wonderful life that I didn't think I needed God in my life. Um, it is critical that we would speak the message of reconciliation to people, and I don't think there's anything greater than doing that and seeing people come to Christ. And so today, uh, my whole purpose here is that you would embrace it. That's what I've been talking about so far. Uh, second, I want, to, I want to outline this for us, and then thirdly, illustrate it. Uh, but as we talk about this, what I'd like to do is give you an outline for the message of salvation, I think it's critical that all of us would have a meta-narrative, an understanding, an overview of what this message is that we are sharing with people. And for some of you, this is foundational, this is basic, you could do this very easily, but for maybe many of us, the reason we're not sharing it is because we're not confident in it, uh, in understanding it. And so what I want to do is I want to give you four parts to the story. Uh, if you were to boil the story down into four chapters, uh, there would be four chapters, creation, fall, redemption, and new creation. And uh, as you begin to share the message of Christ, the message of reconciliation with people, we start with creation. We'll go to chapter one. And as I'm talking with people and I'm starting to share uh, the message uh, with them, I think there's two important things when we talk about creation. The first one is that we share about two people, uh, God and people, uh, that we would begin to explain who God is to people, and as, I, as I'm talking to people, well, the, the story begins with God. And I left 
a, a space here, an empty space here, because uh, as you're sharing this message, I think it's critical that all of us would share from our heart who God is in your life. Uh, God is amazing. He is the creator. He created all things. The scriptures teach that in the beginning, that he was there in the beginning, that he created all things. Uh, the Bible uses multiple words to describe God. It uses shepherd, that he is our shepherd. A lot of people have heard Proverbs uh, 20, or, uh, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Uh, he is also a father. The scriptures teach it that he is the most amazing father. Uh, the scriptures teach that he is love. God is love. And that he is not far from any one of us. In fact, he desires to know us, to have a relationship with us, to talk with us. Now, this is who God is. And as he created the world, uh, we're also told that God created people. And that in his creation, the crown of his creation on earth was people. Uh, in fact, Genesis 127, God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female. He created them. God created people different than everything else in creation. He created them in his likeness, in his image. Why did he do that? Because God is a relational God. Uh, by the way, as you're explaining God, it would be important to teach who God is. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He has existed. He is not like us. He is a multi-dimensional being, uh, one God who exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for all of eternity. And he is a relational God. He's been in relationship for all of eternity, and he created people that he might be in relationship with them. And even if you go back to the garden, you see God walking and talking with his people. He created us to know us, to have a relationship with us. And as you begin to explain creation, then eventually you will turn the page to talk about the fall. Uh, because as amazing as God created people, it wasn't long until those people fell. They fell from the image that God had created them. Uh, they were glorious beings and they lost that glory because of sin. They, they chose, instead of walking with God and worshiping God, they chose to rebel, to, to go a different direction, to try, try life on their own. In fact, Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, God produced all of these trees and this amazing place, and he said, I want you to be fruitful and I want you to multiply, but do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for on that day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And they did. They chose to do life their own way. Um, I think as I look at my life, there has been so many times, in fact, I could say, I would say that there was a season of my life where I just wanted to do life my own way. In fact, I was sort of born that way, and if any of you have kids, you understand kids wanna do things their way. And what this has caused is it's caused a death in the relationship with God, a division, a devastation. In fact, when the, when the Bible speaks about death, it is speaking not just about physical death, but spiritual death and devastation. And it just describes this. And as we look at the world today, if you just turn on the news, you see all of the brokenness in relationships. You see the self-serving nature of people. And I think if you would look at your life, you would see the self-serving nature of yourself. Uh, we have a tendency to want the best for us and everything okay for everyone else. And if you disagree with me, when's the last time you took a look at a group picture? And you know, you're looking at the group picture and who's the person that you're looking to in the picture to see who looks best and looks good in the picture? You may look terrible and everyone else looks great, but you're like, no, 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 we're not using that picture. If you look great and everybody else looks terrible, let's use that picture. We just, there is this inward root in us that wants things our way and to do things our way rather than to submit to 
God because he is holy and perfect and he is teaching you how to do life his way. Uh, Mankind fell and they were judged. Uh, The scriptures say, Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Notice they have fallen short of the glory which God created them to have. Uh, God created them to know him and to live with him and walk with him and experience life with him. And as we walk through the Bible, uh, I mean, I'm doing it in four chapters, but it's something like 1,800 chapters, but as you walk through the Bible, you see this continuing message throughout that mankind tried to solve the sin problem in their life. They tried to stop sinning. They tried to start doing good and to be in good and to live with God and to serve God. But as you see, as you go through the Bible, man could never do it. Man and women could never do it. They always found themselves at some point, even though God would, I mean, there were these agreements, these covenants that God made, and even though uh, uh, they would take steps forward, it seemed that there was always the stepping back, the always moving back to serving themselves and doing life their own way. And because of God's great love for us, he never stopped pursuing us. Uh, He's been pursuing you all of your life. Some of you are here today and you get your sin. You understand as you look at your life, yes, I've I've done a lot of things in my life. And you wear the guilt of your sin. And God's great love for us as we turn the chapter is what we call redemption. Redemption is a word that means to regain status. Status to regain status through the payment of a price, actually. And uh, what the scriptures teach us is we we walk through the Bibles that people can't redeem themselves. And if you're a sports person, you you get this, that that you you get the concept of redemption, that if you've ever played a bad game, or, or maybe at work, you've gone to work and you just had a bad day and you did some bad things, and and you want to redeem yourself. You want to get back to the place that you know you could be. And that's what redemption is, that we, even though we have fallen and lost the glory which we were created, that God would restore us, or that we would be restored and regain that status of peace with God and walking with God. But in this chapter of the Bible, this chapter of the meta narrative of the Bible, we see people can't do it. They can't be good enough. They will always turn from God. And yet, God, because of his great love for us, sent his son Jesus to give his life for us, to redeem us. A righteous God, a righteous God who became a man and who died on a cross to pay a price that we could never pay so that we might live a life that we could never live without him. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And this is what God has done for us. And uh, Jesus died for us so that we could become alive in him and be redeemed to this life that God desires for us. And if we turn to the fourth chapter in this meta narrative, uh, what we know is that there is a new creation when a person experiences redemption, and when they are regenerated uh, to this new life, that there, we become a new creation. Second Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things, old things have passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. And this is the hope, this is the promise that we have in Christ that we become new. But it's not just you that is becoming new. God is making all things new. He is working towards building the most amazing place that will restore the original creation to what God intended And this is what we call heaven and the day is coming when a new heaven and a new earth will come 
And all of those who would choose to walk with God and to uh, experience this life with God will experience life with him in heaven. And that means that on the day that you die, when you go, and I don't know if it's going to be like this, but you go to heaven's gates, if it's going to look like this. Let's play this out for just a moment. And you're standing there on heaven's gates, and God comes to heaven's gates, and he opens the door, and he says, why is it that you should enter into heaven and live in this perfect place, this place of perfection? Why is it that I should let you into heaven? Uh, If it happens like that on that day, I will say it's not because of anything that I have done. It's not because of what I do. It's because of what Jesus has done for me. And I've received this new life on the basis of Jesus' righteousness. Let me just illustrate this real quick to you because I think so many times we're sitting in the cafe or sitting at the school and people are asking about God and you want to tell the story of God and in just a few minutes you can tell the story of God through this illustration that maybe many of you have seen through the years. Uh, But as we share this, I would just begin by talking about God and God exists. He created all things. And the scriptures say that he exists as Father, Son, I'm going to put J for Jesus, and Holy Spirit. And so God has existed throughout all eternity. Uh, Three persons. One God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the scriptures tell us, we know this about God, that he is a God that loves, a God that is good, a God that is just, and he created man and women. If you can draw really good, then go ahead and just draw it, right? Uh, We've got uh, man and women, and and he has created people. And he created them as amazing people. Like, like they were different than everything else in, crea- in creation. He created them in his image. Uh, that they would know him. That they would have a relationship with him. That they would do life together. But before, not long after the creation, we're told that those people that God created chose to go their own way. Uh, they sinned. Instead of walking God's way and following God and obeying God, they chose to do life on their own. And that sin, because God is holy and just, brought upon judgment. Uh, God, uh, there was a, uh, a separation that occurred. There was a penalty that occurred because of their sin, and they said, oh, we want to do life, and so God said, okay, go do life. But you need to know it will bring death and devastation to your life. And so it did. And there was a chasm. If this was a mountain, two mountain ranges, there was a massive chasm that occurred in the relationship between God and his people. And for years, for hundreds of years, God took steps to bring people back to himself. That's the story of the Bible, the Old Testament. I mean, he... uh, gave them kings and prophets and uh, created a space for them to live and he gave them laws. But he found that over and over and over again, even though there would be days, there would be moments they would walk with God, they eventually would walk away from God. And so when man and women could not solve this problem on their own, and that's also you and me, God sent... His son Jesus to die on a cross to be the bridge to pay the price to take our sin the righteous penalty for our sin upon himself and he died on that cross so that we could place our sin on him And we could be reunited with God. We could be redeemed at one again, at peace with God. And Jesus said that if you would repent and believe, if you would 
Repent, which means to turn away from yourself and to turn back to God. And you would believe in who Jesus is and what he has done for you that you will become one again with God. And this is the glorious part of the story. And, and when you believe, you don't just uh, be, you're not just justified, which means God makes you just or it's just as you never sin. He births you to a new life that you live with God and you experience this new life here on earth and you will experience this new life in heaven with him. And that is the hope of the gospel. And so by invitation, more than an invitation, because if you read 2 Corinthians, he doesn't give an invitation. He says, I implore you, I, I beg of you that you would be reconciled to God, not based upon what you do, but be based upon what Jesus has done. Put your faith in what he has done and be at peace with God. And develop this life with him, a life like none other, in the glory of which he created you. This is the gospel. This is the hope that God is calling us to. I was at a concert last night in Springfield, and there was a band that sang this song, and as they sang this song, I just sat there. I said, man, this is the gospel, this song, and I want you to watch it and I want you to ponder it right now. Listen to the gospel. When I was young, you called my name. I tried to run, but still you came And you stepped into the dark Cause that's just the kind of God you are When heaven seems beyond my reach You still see eternity in me you're turning ashes into art Cause that's just the kind of God you are It's in the empty tomb It's on the rugged cross Your death-defying love Is written in your scars You'll never quit on me You'll always hold my heart Cause that's the kind From my sin You told me I could start again All I heard is dead and gone Now we're your daughters and your sons Amazing grace, how sweet the sound We once were lost but now we're found Forever you hold
young, you called my name. I tried to run, but still you came. And you stepped into the dark, cause that's just the kind of God you are. I'm here today to make an appeal on behalf of God to you. I am here today speaking for God, an ambassador for him. And I beg of you, I implore you that you would be reconciled to God. You can't be reconciled to God by what you do. No amount of going to church and giving money and trying to be good will ever save you. And in that place of life, Jesus stepped into the world, into the darkness. And he died on a cross to take your sin, to pay for a price for you so that you could have his righteousness. And be adopted into the family of God to be sons and daughters of the King. And when you become a son and daughter of the King, you inherit all of the goodness of the kingdom. And I'm here today to appeal on his behalf that you would repent and believe and be reconciled to God. Titus chapter three. This is the gospel. Chapter three, verse three. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice, that's hatred and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life, The saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people and for the world. Jesus stepped into the darkness so that you wouldn't have to spend your life for the rest of eternity there. And I appeal to you today be reconciled to God. The scriptures say in Romans chapter 11, Romans chapter 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, you will be saved. Confess with your mouth right now. Jesus is my Lord. Would you do that? As a congregation, will we just say this? Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Lord. And believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. He is alive in heaven today. And if you believe that, so are you. So will you. You will live forever with him. This is the gospel. The call, he's calling your name today. If you've never been saved, be reconciled with him. And if you've been saved, he's calling you to go speak this message this week. How else will they know unless someone proclaims, unless someone goes?